hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the Hudson Institute's ongoing coverage of Russia's war against Ukraine. My name is Matt Boyce. I'm an adjunct fellow here at Hudson. It's my distinct honor and pleasure and privilege to welcome two distinguished guests to Hudson, former uh, uh, Prime, uh, former Minister of, uh, of Ukraine, Pablo Klimkin, and Reika Smerkini from the International Republican Institute. Um, Pablo, uh, you have been the foreign minister of Ukraine during five action-packed years, 2014 to 2019. You were the uh, ambassador of Ukraine to Germany. You were the uh, a deputy foreign minister who, uh, among other things, prepared the association agreement with the EU. And it, that, of course, uh, and, and were known as the sort of Ukraine's face of European integration. You, um, you were, you were, we of course know how that ended. Uh, the president at the time, Viktor Yanukovych, declined to sign that. And of course, uh, that led ultimately to the Euromaidan and the Revolution of Dignity. Now you had a, um, a think tank in Kyiv, the Center for National Resilience and Development. So welcome back to Hudson. Reka, uh, you are the transatlantic, uh, you are the senior advisor for transatlantic a strategy at, at IRI, uh, and formerly you were the, uh, the ambassador of Hungary to the United States. Uh, welcome back. You're a, a, a great Atlanticist and a great friend, so welcome back to Hudson. And of course, we have uh, none other. We have our uh, Luke Coffey, senior fellow at Hudson, needs no introduction, prolific <laughs> writer uh, on Ukraine and other issues. So anyway, we have a, a, an, a, an interesting, a very interesting panel today. Uh, just a, a couple, just one housekeeping issue before we start. Uh, Pablo will make some remarks uh, of you know a number of you know five ten minutes at the beginning, and then we'll move to the conversation afterwards. So, um, Pablo, it, it's great to have you here. Welcome back to DC, and um, the the floor is yours. Uh, Matt, thanks a lot for the friendliest ways of teasing me up on uh, on your integration and, and, and faces, but uh, I indeed spent. Uh, kind of 20 years uh, on the European Union and negotiated uh, our EU-Ukraine uh, association agreement. Uh, I believe uh, there is an intrinsic link uh, between uh, our drive towards Europe and towards uh, the European Union uh, and Russian and Putin attempts to destroy Ukraine as such. Putin uh, is not able, fundamentally not able, uh, to see Ukraine as Ukraine. Uh, for him, uh, Ukraine is, uh, is either Russia or anti-Russia, the way he called us uh, in his uh, famous article. Uh, Ukraine uh, is artificial. Uh, there is no Ukrainian language, uh, no statehood, uh, no history, basically nothing. And it's a fundamental part uh, of the Russian ideology, how he understands it. But even more so, and I remember it quite well, uh, the whole uh, Russian and Putin's drive uh, on Ukraine started uh, for me in 2003. I was a uh, humble director general on EU affairs. And in 2003, Putin started uh, two big exercises against us. One is to uh, impose uh, so-called uh, common economic space on us. It's the idea to uh, swallow Ukrainian economy and fully control it under the Russian uh, rules. It's what uh, Putin uh, won to impose now on Belarus and Lukashenko. And the second idea was so-called trilateral uh, gas consortium, uh, Russia, Ukraine, and Germany, and the real goal of Putin was uh, to get 50% uh, plus full control of our gas, gas transit system, uh, full control over transit to Europe, which was uh, from the very beginning uh, and actually from the Soviet time, uh, a fundamental uh, leverage of dependence towards, uh, towards Europe. 
both exercises, and uh, I was a member of our delegation in, uh, in both of these exercises, failed. And we are quite proud of that. Uh, you, uh, you remember the history after that uh, Tuzla came, the idea to dig uh, the Kerr Straits and uh, Orange Revolution and Yanukovych. Uh, I'm saying all that uh, to show the sense uh, that it's not a kind of uh, out of the blue reaction by Putin. Two years ago, uh, one year ago, uh, 2014 or before that, for, uh, for him, it's a sense of mission. So, uh, to destroy Ukraine uh, as such, to destroy Ukrainian identity, he clearly understands uh, having Ukraine and even more having Ukraine uh, as, uh, as European country would destroy uh, his sense and Russian sense of what Russia should be. And there is deeply entrenched uh, sense also in Russia among people, a sense uh, of being offended because of the whole Im uh, empire and Soviet uh, Union project uh, was, uh, was broken. It's how it's all, uh, it's all started. We can discuss uh, military stuff uh, and all the issues a bit later, but I want to map out uh, uh, three, I believe, very important points uh, about uh, where we, we, we want uh, to hit uh, at the end of the day. And it's about the future, it's about uh, the end game, although I hate this, you know, a bit bureaucratic definition. But it's about the future sense of security for Ukraine. Of course, uh, we... We are confident uh, to make decisive gains on the battleground, but uh, we need uh, in any kind of uh, future negotiations, and I believe negotiations uh, with Russia are only possible from the clear position of strength. And it's not just about uh, how you understand Russia. It's also about Putin's mentality and Russian mentality. You can effectively negotiate with Russia only from the position of strength. <clears throat> and such position of strength uh, could be and will be created uh, because of military advances. Such a position of strength uh, could be and should be created uh, because of economic pressure and economic isolation of Russia. And here we need strategic clarity because normally sanctions is about changing someone's behavior. Sanctions and restrictions uh, now applied to Russia are going wider in the sense of strategically weakening Russia. We all understand uh, that uh, by more sanctions, we are unfortunately unable to change Putin behavior because it's a sense of mission and ideology. We, uh, we of course, need to strategically weaken Russia, but uh, if you see it from Kiev, not from DC or Paris, <coughs> it's about lives, it's about time, and we are running against the clock. So we need to uh, cut off uh, real uh, possibilities for Russia to wage this war in the same way how it's been waged now, and to undercut Putin's and his regime ability. And here we need the sense of Western solidarity because now discussions about more export restrictions have been getting so difficult with the European Union, but also with others. And we need this sense of leadership uh, again from the U.S. Uh, what uh, the U.S. Uh, showed uh, in the run-up uh, to the all-out invasion and, uh, and during this war. So, of course, it's about military assistance. Of course, it's about uh, exchange of information. Of course, it's about logistics. 
but uh, it's definitely also about uh, further economic isolation of Russia. And my third point, we need uh, sustainable security in Europe as, uh, as a result of this war. Simply to freeze it up and say, look, uh, let's wait a bit, uh, let's have a break. Uh, we're gonna see what, uh, what could happen afterwards. Uh, let's try to manage it. Uh, it's, it's crazy dangerous. Uh, we, can, uh, we can be as creative as possible and generate different ideas about security. I, I spent uh, you know, decades on security policy, but uh, very roughly, I could uh, structure different options uh, in, uh, in, three, in three main scenarios on security. One uh, would uh, I, I like to call a sort of porcupine scenario. It's about uh, giving Ukraine uh, the way to deter Russia, to give us uh, as much weapons as possible, as sophisticated as possible, to ensure logistics, to ensure supply, uh, to ensure basically everything, and of course to support us financially and technologically, but saying, look guys, after that, it's about you to care about your security. We are unable, or better to say unwilling, to go into uh, commitments uh, or real security guarantees. Uh, it's a very traumatic experience uh, for, for the Ukrainians to talk about uh, 1994, uh, Stat 1 Treaty and Budapest Memorandum. Stat 1 Treaty was uh, my first responsibility as I joined uh, the foreign ministry on strategic, uh, uh, strategic arms control and disarmament. Uh, ABM Treaty and <coughs> Stat 1 Treaty were my first assignments. And here we made a fundamental mistake, of course, in how we handle it. Because, uh, you know, we, uh, we should have uh, asked for NATO membership for the association agreement. But it's difficult uh, to, be, to judge people uh, backwards, because how you, uh, you expect uh, the guy in charge of uh, ideology in the Ukrainian Communist Party to come up and say, now it's about EU and NATO, and it's about our future security. Uh, but anyway, uh, I believe that uh, a kind of Ukrainian deterrence is a fundamentally not sustainable option. Uh, it's unfair towards Ukraine and, and the Ukrainians. It would not work. It would create another spiral of uh, uncertainty. L uh, let's talk about Ukrainian recovery. Who would uh, invest? internally or externally in Ukraine, if you have all the risks, and it's, it's just about Ukrainian deterrence. Uh, we all understand that if we, we are in a conventional reality, the Russians uh, have uh, more potential in the sense of the security and defense sector, and the sheer scope of, uh, of Russia. So for me, this, uh, this option, uh, is fundamentally wrong. The second option, let's call it kind of Ukrainian uh, fortress of guarantees, is about uh, a network of bilateral guarantees or one comprehensive set of guarantees, probably uh, by NATO, but uh, we can play uh, we can play it uh, you know in a different way, legally or uh, from the political point of view. Uh, it actually quite problematic, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I've been asked many times by uh, by my friends here in DC or in Europe, um, saying, "Look, well, um, uh, there could be sort of extended deterrence." A uh, couple of days ago, the Korean president has been there talking about extended deterrence. Uh, I, I'm not drawing any parallels. Don't get me wrong, you know, uh, <coughs> between Korea and Ukraine or between Japan and. Uh, and Ukraine. And we could actually imagine a, a network of security guarantees, but for me, it could be just 
a sort of transitional, so the transitional solution towards, uh, towards the NATO membership. Uh, e, and the key problem, the key challenge uh, with such guarantees uh, is uh, whether you guarantee these guarantees, whether you, uh, you trust these guarantees. I remember discussion, uh, discussions uh, within the NATO about whether the Article 5 is bulletproof. I remember Estonia and the Poles asking whether it's bulletproof and how can, uh, can we trust that. Maybe it's wrong in the sense of solidarity and trust. But at the backdrop of, uh, of Russia, how we have it, uh, it, uh, it unfortunately makes sense. And the third option, it's about NATO. Uh, and uh, with all kind of difficult discussions here about uh, not willing to get into direct conflict uh, with Russia, with all kind of fears and uh, uh, you know, lack of will uh, to raise the stakes and uh, the, the kind of uh, difficult discussions where how, uh, how Russia would react, my, my sense, uh, if you like, a sort of educated guess here is that Putin would not be able to react in a kind of forceful way. But for the West, uh, it, it would be the moment of truth. It would be a way to avoid uh, a key security vacuum. And the reason why we have uh, war against Russia is actually, and was security vacuum, and is still security mm -hmm. vacuum. Around, uh, around Ukraine. And of course it's about us. And as, as a Ukrainian, I care about Ukraine, but talk about Moldova. What kind of security model <laughs> can we take for Moldova? Uh, we can basically go on with yeah. a number, with a number of uh, examples. Uh, and uh, any sort of end game, it's exactly my point, is not possible without getting ambitious on security for Ukraine. And we need this prospect. Uh, we need a clear idea how the security of Ukraine uh, should, be, should be guaranteed in the future. Mm -hmm. Without that, it all, uh, it all gonna come back. Uh, just imagine, uh, we, don't, we, 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 we again have kind of assurances. Uh, discussion about uh, asymmetric deterrence uh, will definitely come back, whether it's nuclear or something else. Putin again will use it as a sort of pretext, pretext and it's going to be a sort of vicious circle, a kind of spiral of uncertainty and, uh, and destabilization. <coughs> so to sort it out uh, once and for all, would be a really important point. And for the Western credibility, it's not just about us and Russia, it's also about China, it's about uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, so uh, anything uh, we could discuss in the sense uh, of how we, uh, we could imagine uh, what uh, should happen in the future is for me about clear idea how, uh, how security should be ensured around Ukraine and around uh, the whole region. It's my point. Uh, and let me stop here yep. because we could yep. discuss uh, some... <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to I'm afraid I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I've been talking already for kind of a yeah. uh, well, quarter of an hour. It's, 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 it's time to shut up and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and switch to good discussions uh, well, you, uh, with you, friends. You've come, a lo you've come a long way, so that's okay. That's okay. In fact, we want to take advantage of yeah. your presence here to, to hear uh, your views. But uh, picking up on something you just said at the very beginning, it's sort of a bit of a historical issue uh, before we get into, into all the uh, other more current events. You, so, you, you, know, you, you mentioned how this has been on, on Putin's agenda now for years and years and years. And I'm, uh, I, you know, I know you, you, you argued to this in, in 2017 in The Guardian where you basically talked about as Putin's obsession with restoring Soviet hegemony as the greatest threat to uh, security and unity of Europe since 1945. And then in 2020, uh, you predicted in Salon that Putin may go for the jugular if then candidate Biden were to win the 2020 election. Now, looking back, um, I mean, you know, what do you think about this now? I mean, you probably would prefer to have been wrong. Um, but, but who among the experts, since we're at a think tank, who among the, the, the pundits, the academics, the, 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 you know, the, 
the, the think tankers, the statesmen and women, who was right and who was not. And, and any sort of, what does this say about this, the state of, 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 of expertise in, you know, in this country or elsewhere about, about your country and about Russia? And then we'll go on to the, the more current issues that everyone's thinking about. If, if I say almost everybody, it, it would be probably a real uh, overstatement here. I uh, recall quite well uh, political consultations in Germany at the end of uh, 2008, right after the Georgian War. Uh, and I said uh, to the guys uh, present in the room, uh, it's highly likely, and I believe the probability is 50% uh, or more, that the next goal for uh, for Putin uh, should have been uh, Ukraine. They told me, no, Pavel, look, uh, you know, it's, uh, of course, it's about gas, it's about oil, it's about all this uh, interdependence, and Putin is, uh, is not an idiot. Uh, uh, it's, uh, basically, I, I remember these consultations quite well. It's literally so. Uh, and my point was, uh, Putin is quite rational, but not uh, rational in your sense. Uh, he has different set of goals, and he said uh, he he has a different uh, set of values. So I I do prefer uh, actually being wrong on uh, on my ideas and and on my predictions. Uh, I was trying to convince people, and very vocally, the Germans uh, were kind of uh, kind of bitter on me, drumming up about uh, the Nord Stream two. I was very vocal in German media, and once actually uh, the former Chancellor Merkel sat uh, around the table when uh, we were discussing uh, actually Normandy format, completely different topic. That you know we have a couple of people in the room present, um, you know, in every interview to German media talking about uh, Nord Stream two and the security risks. And now you basically see the security risk because for Putin it was about uh, circumventing Ukraine with gas flows and uh, to attack Ukraine uh, after that uh, right away. So uh, my point, firstly, if the West uh, substantially lost uh, competence uh, on, on Russia, uh, a lot of people uh, pretend to understand uh, Russia, but uh, you know, are not able to, uh, to feel what is going on internally. Secondly, even uh, after 15 uh, months of all-out invasion, there is still no analysis on mistakes made. With all kind of uh, pushing the button, you know, reload of relations uh, with Russia for whatever reasons. And for me, it's not a kind of blaming exercise, you know, uh, kind of uh, showing people uh, understanding uh, on what Russia is. And in the same way, China, although I'm not drawing any parallel here, it's a different world, it's a different autocracy. Mm -hmm. Is, is critical and we can't, uh, uh, we can't go on with uh, pretending, understanding them, sitting there and saying um, one, two, three. So fundamentally we believe we were quite unfortunately right on Putin, on the nature of the regime, on uh, Europe uh, somehow nurturing Putin uh, in the sense of economic model. And we have to say it uh, in, a very, uh, in a very honest way. Again, yeah. not yeah. as a part of blaming game, but uh, as, uh, as our understanding how it's happened. Right. This may seem like ancient history, of course, but it is actually also relevant for the present. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, unfortunately. Ancient uh, yeah. history, definitely not for me. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it is very living history for you and, and, for, and, and for your country. 
men and women. Um, Reka, switching to Central Europe uh, for uh, your perspective, Central European perspective, as, as a former ambassador to Hungary and the United States, for example, um, how, um, and, and focusing on that as you do right now at IRI, how are uh, Central European countries uh, holding up under the economic stress? I mean, is, is pressure in Central Europe growing for any kind of end game that Paula was referring to? Um, what can we expect in Central Europe in the next uh, six months or so in terms of their approaches towards the war? Uh, yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for, for doing this discussion and uh, for inviting me. I think it is a very sensitive moment we are in now from a Central European perspective. We could see just recently the uh, demonstrations of the um, agriculturers because of the, uh, um, yeah. well, originally transit, but then, of course, the import of uh, Ukrainian uh, grain through Central Europe. And I think it is a sensitive moment because what we need to be focusing on is how to keep they support political, in a political and, and strategic sense, for the uh, support for Ukraine. And so, yes, uh, we have to focus on that. And I think this has been raised by the Polish uh, um, po um, uh, official political positions to how to solve this and ultimately, you know, relatively fast, you know, the European reaction could kind of ease this pressure. But there is no doubt that the, this kind of a, um, uh, an economic and political pressures can uh, be directed at decreasing the support from behind uh, the efforts to, uh, for Ukraine. So I think um, what Central Europe has been experiencing is without saying or, or um, really focusing <coughs> on this, is the collapse of several big theories uh, that Europe and Central Europe, part of Central Europe, but primarily Europe, based its relations uh, to Russia on. One is, for instance, that mutual trade and um, yeah, uh, ex expanding on trade relations will create a stability and a, 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 a security. Yep. Another one was that, uh, exactly, uh, or cooperation in various sectors can lead over to strategic cooperation, which none of those happen. So I think we could see the collapse of two big theories that Europe based its uh, relations to Russia on, and that had a direct in, uh, repercussion for Central Europe as well. So um, uh, this is why I think the uh, strategic uh, understanding of Central Europe, what we can see uh, in the last uh, year since uh, Russia's attack on, on uh, Ukraine, uh, is more than just a reaction to a new geopolitical reality. It's a, a reaction of creating a new approach towards Russia. And I think that's why we're in a very important moment, because Ukraine will have to be very strong a part of this new uh, strategy towards dealing with Russia. Yeah. Um, Luke, um, you've been very vocal in making the case for sustained US commitment to Ukraine. Uh, and, but Kiev and other countries may be looking with some concern at the domestic debates in the United States uh, and con other countries providing support. Um, how should Ukrainians understand the state of play here in this country? Should Kiev be concerned, even if the Biden administration stresses it will be with Ukraine for as long as it takes? Uh, thanks. It's, yeah. it's great to be on this yeah. platform with Pablo and Enrica and, and um, to talk about these important issues. The problem with the administration's uh, language saying that the U.S. will be with Ukraine for however long it takes is no one has defined the word it. it. Yeah. Right. So is it uh, victory? Is it equal victory? Does it equal some sort of negotiated settlement? And uh, to be fair, the, the problem the, the White House has is that really only the Ukrainians can define it. Uh, and, and luckily, they have for us. Uh, President Zelensky has been very clear that he sees the full restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity based off the, the 1999 or 1991 borders as uh, their definition of victory. And we should be, a plan we should be planning... Uh, our aid and our support to Ukraine based off uh, those lines. We should uh, have our planning assumptions, uh, assuming that um, Ukraine will uh, attempt to restore its full territorial integrity to include Crimea. The problem we have here in Washington is a lack of leadership from the very top explaining to the American people why the situation in Ukraine matters to them and doing so in a way they understand. When President Biden does talk about this, he uses these vague terms that most Americans 
what most people that don't understand, like, you know, we have to defend the uh, international rules-based order. Well, I, you know, I've been in Washington for many years and I've worked on international affairs for many years and I'm not sure I know what he means when he says that. Uh, we've also um, been giving Ukraine just enough to survive and not enough to win when it comes to our military support. And we, we're now entering this uh, continuous cycle of, uh, of this buildup for you of U.S. support to Ukraine in anticipation of some expected counteroffensive, and then you have this low where we go back to the survival mode, and then we then presumably we'll start this up again sometime next year where we'll start the training and the equipping again for the next uh, counteroffensive um, in 2024. We have to change this mentality. Instead of seeing the war in Ukraine as a series of individual battles to be fought, we have to start seeing the war uh, against Ukraine as a continuous campaign where the U.S. is prepping and preparing Ukraine for one counteroffensive and then simultaneously laying the groundwork to help Ukraine survive the next winter and then prepare for the following year. Uh, right now, we have this disconnected approach where we're not seeing it as one uh, continuous uh, campaign event. And so this is a concern for me as well. My final concern um, <coughs> is that expectations are so high for this upcoming counteroffensive uh, that there's already some people suggesting that U.S. future U.S. aid to Ukraine it will be contingent on Ukraine success or failure in this upcoming offensive. And this is the wrong way to, to look at the situation. Uh, throughout the history of war, there's always been ups and downs. Uh, there's going to be uh, defeats and victories on the battlefield. Uh, we, ha we cannot um, predicate or decide future U.S. military assistance to Ukraine based off a, a single event. And we have to look at the big strategic picture. So I think a little bit more leadership from the White House, explaining to the American public why Ukraine matters, explaining to Capitol Hill why it's in our interest to support Ukraine would go a long way. Yeah, very good. Um, so, um, Pablo, uh, turn to you again. So, so you've just uh, arrived from, uh, from Kiev. And so, I mean, sort of maybe we get a, a sense from you of like, what's, what's the mood on the ground there? I mean, uh, you know, the Ukrainian people have made it through a very harsh winter and, winter and, and, and made enormous, in, in, enormous sacrifices over the last 15 months or so. Um, what's, what's the mood on the ground there? I mean, uh, in the capital and across the country, um, how would you describe the resiliency? Uh, your center is called the Center for National Resilience. How, how would you call you describe the, 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 the you know the morale and resilience of, of, of Ukrainian society as as the counteroffensive approaches? It's a, it's an important part of resilience uh, in the center, but it's about security or energy resilience, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, in the sense of mood, it's amazing. I am simply. Uh, you know, so much proud of my fellow Ukrainians when you see people sitting uh, uh, in, uh, in their apartments uh, through all blackouts, uh, partly without uh, district heating, uh, with people working on that after all these missiles, uh, without communication. And there is... Um, a new, uh, new sense of, uh, of, uh, of national uh, pride uh, and actually trust in, in, in ourselves. After, after all that, uh, <coughs> Ukrainians are fundamentally different uh, mentally from the Russians. Uh, many people uh, started understanding that only 2014 and uh, even more so from the moment of the all-out invasion. It's now understood in, in Europe that Ukraine is Europe and the Ukrainians are Europeans. Uh, but before that, it was kind of a mantra which uh, has been voiced every time, but so what? Uh, but now Ukrainians, uh, if you see any opinion poll, 
uh, it's uh, kind of 90% of Ukrainians uh, who are unwilling to enter into any sort of compromise with Putin. It's nine from 10 after more than one year of the war, after, after this winter, after what, uh, what happened. And uh, it's, it's really a sort of new sense of uh, identity, what, uh, what we are about in, in Ukraine. It's about uh, this simple feeling that uh, we are able to fight and we are willing to fight. Because it's about uh, Ukraine we want to live in. And we don't want to live in a kind of Russian-led Ukraine. It's over. It's, uh, it's so much clear for, for everyone. And uh, of course, uh, we could have done better. The point uh, Luke uh, have just mentioned. You know, we did uh, very well on the ground uh, in uh, September, in October, with liberating territories around Kharkiv and Kherson. And it's really about uh, ma uh, you know, trying to control, uh, to control this war, like a kind of uh, conflict, uh, what you see as a part of simulating that. Why uh, not to give Ukraine uh, all the armored vehicles, but also tanks actually in full? to prepare ourselves logistically, to prepare ourselves militarily. And now it's a kind of almost heroic exercise to get everything to Ukraine, what is needed to the set of one coming uh, counter offensive. But uh, if uh, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd done it uh, in October, in November, in the sense of training, in the sense of structuring, you know, we, uh, we should not discuss all kind of military details here. And the fundamental point here, if, if, you, uh, if you like to win against the Russians, and it's possible, it's really possible, it's a, it's a game changer, it's a, it's a mental change that you can win against the Russians. But in order to win, you have to start fighting. And fighting uh, is linked to the risks. Fighting uh, has its costs. Mm -hmm. And as Ukrainians, we are, we, are, we are ready to bear this cost. But it's important that the, that the rest, our allies, uh, at least uh, are ready to, to also raise the stakes. Because without raising the stakes, you can win. Uh, with... Uh, it's, it's either you are uh, dragging down the whole exercise, it's with clear understanding that Russia is not sustainable, that, uh, of course, uh, Russia has to be strategically weakened, but uh, it's, a, it's a different clock ticking in Ukraine. If you sit in Kiev and if you sit in, in D.C., and I'm saying it with all kind of respect for, for my friends here, because... Uh, what uh, had been done in this war would not be possible without the U.S. and without the U.S. leadership. One clear lesson of this war, there is no collective West without the U.S. leadership. Whether the U.S. actually does want it or, or, or does not. Uh, we would love to have uh, shared leadership, uh, you know, with Europe as a special center and not talking about all senses about European strategic autonomy. And I'm, I've been listening to all these ideas for kind of 10 plus years. But my point is, uh, if, uh, if you believe that uh, we, need, uh, we need to win, uh, and of course we can uh, discuss uh, this definition of what actually uh, victory is for us, for Ukrainians, for the West, and there are some discrepancies within the West, let's be honest. But at least uh, one point should be clear, we have to win. And uh, we can't win just militarily. As I've said, it's also about economic isolation. It's about sanctions. It's about uh, uh, we, uh, the victory should be comprehensive. There is no one way to win uh, against such country as Russia. But uh, now Russia is, uh, is the same uh, like, like the Russian regime. 
So fundamentally, this regime is, uh, is dangerous for everyone, not just for Ukraine. Mm. It's about destabilizing uh, any sort of uh, security enrichment. It's about killing of security enrichments. Because what we had from Helsinki in 70, uh, you know, I'm not sorry, <laughs> 1975, it's dead. Mm. So what is not dead in the sense of security? Russia killed all kinds of arms control uh, treaties and everything. So fundamentally, we have to win. It's really my point. Okay. And here, you know, we, 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 need to, we need to embrace this mentality of winning. Um, speaking of leadership, um, Reka, the Central Europeans have also shown quite, quite a, a very, very strong leadership in this, not only the Poles and the, and the Balts, but others as well. Um, and so, I mean, some people even argue that as a result of, of that, the, the center of gravity in NATO, if not the EU, is moving to the east and to the north with the accession of Finland to NATO and, and hopefully soon Sweden. Um, Western European countries, of course, probably disagree with that, presumably, uh, and uh, explicitly or otherwise. And, 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 and so, who, so who's right? I mean, is the center of gravity moving uh, away, uh, shifting more towards the eastern flank? of NATO, um, and I mean, how should Americans think about this? Um, and does it have any, if, if, uh, any implications that it might have for, for the United States? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, I very much uh, um, can see that. And it's very interesting because I think this is a process that started really before February 2022, but Russia's attack against Ukraine absolutely speeded up history in this sense uh, in Central Europe, and I believe also in, in Ukraine in, in many ways as well. Because what we have seen is that new ideas, new suggestions, new thoughts, initiatives of what the North Atlantic Treaty Organization should do, how it should be you know, prepared to get ready for the next big challenges, have over the last you know, you know, several years have not come from kind of the Western part of the European uh, continent. <coughs> they have always been uh, coming and originating from the Central European countries. And I think that has been a distinct feature before. It has absolutely been highlighted, uh, heightened uh, after February uh, 2022. And I think you know, what is very clear is that it's not just, okay, geopolitics have you know, appeared big time in, uh, in our thinking and in foreign policy thinking. But that can create several types of reactions. It could create you know, giving up and just saying, okay, we can't do anything you know, about our future. It can create you know, messing up. It's like not knowing, you know, running around and, and creating strange, you know, uh, um, uh, political uh, messaging. Or it can create a very uh, strong focus on priorities. And I think this is what has uh, been dominant in Central Europe. It has created focus. It has created a very clear list of priorities. Um, not just the, uh, like, within a month after the attack, I think in March 2022, we could see the 10 points uh, developed by uh, the Polish uh, uh, Premier Morawiecki on how to deal with uh, the, uh, how to respond to the uh, attack of Russia. But also, uh, ever since, I think all the agenda inside the European Union discussions as well are being defined, or agenda points are being defined by proposals of Central uh, European members of the EU as well. So both in NATO and in the EU, what we can see is that, okay, we may not agree with all the points, and some points may not be acceptable for several members, that's fine. But the agenda points, the proposals of what to talk about, how to go forward, are absolutely being generated by the Central Europeans. Mm -hmm. So I think this kind of a geo... So geopolitics has created ge geostrategic thinking. And I think this in Central Europe, and I think this is why... Um, the relations with uh, Ukraine are particularly important because Ukraine has obviously seen this you know, very fundamental ties with Washington. But it will, and I think identifying in NATO and security guarantees inside NATO and NATO membership, identifying EU membership uh, will be a process. Especially for the EU uh, discussions, I think there will be a long period in which a lot of decisions are going to be made at, at a table where, um, where Ukraine is not sitting yet. Uh, so I think you know, the, to kind, find that kind of a strategic partnership, uh, both for the United States as well as for Ukraine in the Central European states in particular, I think is going to be the biggest uh, possibility and the biggest uh, strategic development of the next decade. Yeah, Western Europeans need to listen more to Central Europeans. Um, 
Most definitely. So, Luke, um, in, in July, uh, NATO, there will be a major uh, summit in, in, in Vilnius, um, and expectations are very high about what will come out of that uh, regarding Ukraine. Um, how would you define a successful uh, summit in the context of Ukraine? And, and what can NATO do to keep uh, Ukraine on the path of, towards eventual uh, membership? Yeah, like with the uh, expected counteroffensive, expectations are also very high, uh, but this time on the Ukrainian side right. for uh, the outcomes of the summit in Vilnius. We've heard from you know the foreign minister, the defense minister, that they expect very clear messaging on Ukraine's future uh, path to joining NATO. Uh, the high expectations are not unreasonable, uh, considering everything that Ukraine has has um, gone through uh, in, in recent years. And I, uh, my starting point on this issue is uh, acknowledging that uh, symbolism matters in international affairs. So there's some symbolic things that NATO can do that are important that would help Ukraine along its path to NATO, and there are some practical things that can be done. On the, on the symbolic front, uh, NATO has to refresh the stale, tired language from 15 years ago, from the Bucharest summit, when uh, both Ukraine and Georgia were um, first um, acknowledged that they will someday join the alliance. The, we have to use a new set of wording that show, injects new passion and enthusiasm uh, into Ukraine's eventual membership into NATO. Uh, we should also make sure that the, um, the, the uh, Ukraine-NATO Commission meets at the heads of state and government level. In the past, this meeting often takes place at the uh, foreign ministerial level. Uh, I think it would send a strong signal if it was President Zelensky that was set there for this meeting. Uh, we should also um, start a conversation about uh, scrapping the membership action plan. Uh, this is the tool that NATO has used in recent years to bring new countries into the alliance. This tool, the, the map as it's called, was an effective tool for the more straightforward cases in Central and Eastern Europe in the 90s and early 2000s. But the remaining candidate countries have very complex uh, geopolitical situations that warrants a more tailored and bespoke approach. So I have suggested that it could be called a, a tailored action plan geared specifically at the each country's needs and circumstances. And maybe Ukraine could be the first to get a, a, a tailored action plan to chart a, re a re realistic, reasonable path to NATO membership with very clear benchmarks that the Ukrainians would have to meet uh, before an invitation would be um, uh, given. Uh, on, the, on the practical side, um, I would love to see uh, NATO create a new trust fund uh, to support Ukraine. In 2014, uh, at the Wales Summit, NATO created six trust funds focusing on different issues impacting Ukraine, whether it was military wounded or um, you know, counter IED, counter mine operations, for example. Out of the six, three, are remain, three remain because they're more relevant to the fight that's going on today. I propose adding a, 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 a fourth one called um, a Train Today for Tomorrow Trust Fund, where NATO would pull together resources and funding to train Ukrainian soldiers on advanced military equipment that perhaps there are no plans to give Ukraine, but someday we might decide to give to Ukraine. So when we finally decide to give uh, fi uh, fourth generation fighter jets like the F-16 to Ukraine. They'll already have some pilots that are trained on it. They'll already have some ground crew who know how to operate and, and work on, perform the maintenance on it. I think this would be a, a very useful um, uh, way for NATO to help the Ukrainians on the long term. And then another idea I, I've been proposing, and it's not without um, uh, controversy, is that... Uh, NATO should ask Ukraine if it wants to uh, participate in the NATO response force again. Now, I'll state that I understand in this war of national survival, every soldier that Ukraine has needs to be on the front lines uh, defending the homeland and to liberate the territory. But at any given time, there are thousands of Ukrainian soldiers that are outside of Ukraine across Europe doing training. So the symbolism here, I think, would be important. So why not earmark some of these Ukrainian forces that are already 
out of Ukraine training elsewhere in Europe to get certified to, to, to form a, a part of the NATO response force. And that would really show that there is this connection between NATO and Ukraine. Uh, there is a precedent for this. Ukraine has already contributed in the past to NATO response force. And I think that would, that would be a very uh, uh, helpful and symbolic way to show the ongoing uh, NATO-Ukraine relationship. And then finally, I've been proposing a, um, the establishment of a NATO-certified center of excellence for modern warfare. For the past two decades, NATO has been focused on these low-intensity conflicts, counterinsurgency operations, and we have um, uh, on NATO's uh, doorstep, we have Ukraine that's been fighting this very modern state-on-state -state war with, uh, with Russia, and there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Uh, and that not only would help, s s establishing such a center would not only help NATO learn the hard-earned lessons that Ukraine uh, has uh, undergone since uh, last February, but it would also be another way that we could be flying the Ukrainian flag next to the NATO flag. And I think this is mm -hmm. something we should explore. So there are ways we can have a successful summit. Yeah. Let's just hope that there's the political will to, to, to do so. Mm -hmm. Um, Pablo, um, uh, everyone's talking about the counteroffensive now. Um, is this um, counteroffensive a preview to the end game that we've sort of touched upon here? Um, uh, we've we've sort of talked about what the end game is, but I'm I'm not sure everybody really is on the same page with regard to the end game. But what should we think about the about the counteroffensive? Because this is everyone's talking about it. Um, uh, if we say uh, sort of uh, discussion uh, simply has to come after, after military developments, we, we create a sort of uh, trap for ourselves because uh, we have clear goal, uh, as I've said, uh, to win against this regime. There is no other way. Of course, it's about territory. Of course, it's about uh, Ukrainians who live on the occupied territories. It's about liberating uh, part of Ukraine. It's about liberating our soul in the way, because it's about people and people uh, our soul. But uh, saying that after exactly uh, you know, this action or another set of actions, uh, we have to start talking with a deliberate goal uh, to uh, reach uh, a sort of settlement with the Russians. This is fundamentally wrong. It's not just counterproductive, it's wrong. So uh, we need uh, to find a way uh, to understand uh, what should be done militarily. We need uh, to find a way how to raise the stakes uh, on uh, economic pressure, because if you have military offensive not uh, linked uh, by uh, an economic, uh, let's, let's call it economic offensive, it would uh, weaken the whole exercise. And of course, uh, like uh, Luke has just said, uh, we need a powerful message uh, by the West. We need a powerful message by, by NATO. And not in the sense that uh, somewhere in the future, Ukraine uh, will become a member of NATO. It's basically a repetition of what happened in Bucharest. It's like the same narrative that uh, we are going to help Ukraine, uh, you know, for what, uh, for what is needed. So fundamentally, uh, we need a clear goal here. And our goal is to win uh, against Russia. Uh, whether we need uh, this military action or other military actions, uh, my point, uh, we need to do everything to make Ukraine able to have this win together with the West. It's what's really needed. Without uh, imposing on us any sort of restrictions or benchmarks or any sort of conditions, the fundamental uh, problem and the fundamental mistake of the West for me is uh, keeping uh, setting up different red lines. You know, not delivering armored vehicles. You know, I remember these discussions with, uh, with the Germans. And after that, no, 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 these armored vehicles, no. 
After that, okay, in tanks, leopards, no way because it's about reminiscence towards the Second World War. And after that, again, the decision is there. And uh, Russian mentality and Putin's personal mentality is about to explore these weaknesses. Uh, in uh, creating a sort of maze out of the red lines fundamentally weakens your, your position against, against Russia, and, uh, but in a very different way against China. It's what I believe the West uh, really has to learn uh, from this war. So no red lines, but uh, you know the goal and the way how, uh, how to achieve it. Hmm. So we're getting, we're running out of time now. So maybe just uh, quickly for Reka and for Luke. Uh, Reka, so um, some of the Central European capitals right now have a, are, 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 are extremely all in on this, others less so. Um, but, and they argue inter alia that, uh, that without security guarantees and strong institutional linkages um, with Europe, it's only a matter of time before Russia invades you know, Ukraine again or, or another, you know, Moldova or whatever, destabilizes, you know, whatever, uh, Georgia. And, and so any, any, any kind of final thoughts on, on that issue um, before we wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. I believe it's a very um, important question to understand for all of Central Europe, from all of Central Europe's historic experiences and most recent current, uh, economic and political ties in the larger region. What is very clear <clears throat> is that this um, new reality that is, is being shaped now with the, the um, not just the emergence of, um, of a new threat very clearly, uh, old style um, at, the, at NATO's eastern flank, uh, but also by gaining a very active and very um, um, strong new partner in Ukraine for Central Eastern Europe and for Europe in general, I believe this is the moment to grab that uh, possibility to become, you know, shapers and, and makers of, of, you know, of history and absolutely to tie those uh, uh, relations into a future uh, structure of stability and cooperation. And Luke, similarly, that argument also is is being conducted in the United States, where uh, people. Uh, uh, but 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 you've argued, I think, that uh, that 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 um, if uh, that you know, sort of either you support U Ukraine now or be prepared be prepared to spend more later. Um, do you think a Russian uh, defeat would help lessen the cost to NATO member states uh, in the long <clears throat> run? Um, and how should Congress and the administration keep it, this in mind? Going forward. Well, yeah. we're dealing with a, a 21st century Russia with 19th century ambitions. And Russia might be decisively uh, beaten in Ukraine, but history tells us that they will be back. This idea that there'll be some sort of peace dividend like we thought would exist in the 1990s that never materialized, in fact, uh, th this line of thinking is very naive. Uh, for the foreseeable future, uh, the, the U.S. should maintain a very robust military presence in Europe. We should continue working with our allies and partners to improve their military capabilities. The U.S. has a lot of economic uh, and security interests on the European continent, uh, and we should take all of these things into account. And for the foreseeable future, uh, I would say almost indefinitely, Russia will always prioritize its foreign policy and geopolitics geared towards Central and Eastern Europe. Because Vladimir Putin and those around him know that without control or influence over countries like Ukraine or Belarus, Russia is merely an Asian power and it's not a European power. And Moscow wants to be a European player, wants to be a European power. So I think we just have to assume that for the foreseeable future, uh, you know, Russia will be back, even if beaten, and we have to maintain a robust military presence there. Yep. That was one of the things that my former professor at Columbia, Zbigniew Brzezinski, used to say, without Ukraine, Russia is not a superpower. So uh, we've run out of time, unfortunately. There's a lot more we could have talked about. So um, perhaps now we'll just uh, c close now. Uh, thank you, uh, Pablo. Thank you, Reka. And thank you, Luke, for, for, for this interesting discussion. And thank you all for, for, uh, for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to uh, welcoming you back to another Hudson event on this issue and others. Uh, so farewell. Thank you. Thank you.